Hey everyone, Jake here from CVP. IBC 2023 has come and gone, and in today's video, we'll be going through all of the awesome announcements and releases from it. So grab a drink, get comfy, and let's get into it. Just prior to IBC, Blackmagic held one of their standard live streams to announce a few new products. This included three new cameras, two new ASIN panels, and a new video hub. I was really excited to see what new cameras Blackmagic were going to announce, as I'd heard a few things through the grapevine, but nothing concrete. The two new studio cameras are logical updates, and it's great to see the micro studio camera line get a long awaited refresh. The new studio camera 4K Plus G2 adds 12G SDI, talk back via a 3.5mm headset, and network control via USB C with an adapter. Other than that, it shares a lot with the previous model, including the same 4K sensor and MFT lens mount, and it also costs the same as well. The new Micro Studio Camera 4K G2 is definitely a more substantial update over the previous camera, which was looking a bit long in the tooth now. This new model is still incredibly compact and has a very similar design to the old one, but now from the looks of it, has the same 4K sensor used in the Pocket 4K and the current generation studio cameras, which is still a very good sensor and brings it more in line with Blackmagic's modern studio cameras when it comes to image quality and color. It also now has a 12G SDI which uses bayonet type mini BNC connectors, which are a nice upgrade as they lock, unlike the previous model. It can now also output 4K UHD up to 60p and now has a USB-C port, which you can use to record Blackmagic RAW to an external SSD or for network control via ethernet adapters. It can still be powered via LP6 batteries or via the locking 12 volt input on the side of the camera. It's overall just a logical smart update and at just £978, I can see them being very popular for many productions and studios. The last camera that they announced was the Cinema Camera 6K. This camera looks very similar to Blackmagic's existing Pocket 6K, but with a few changes. The biggest being the full frame 6K sensor housed inside. This is a first from Blackmagic and something I know a lot of Blackmagic users have been waiting for. It has a physical size of 36 by 24 millimeters which is rated to capture 13 stops of dynamic range, has a dual native ISO of 400 and 3200, has an optical low pass filter, and can capture the full 3x2 of the sensor in B-RAW up to 36 frames per second, with higher frame rates being possible as you window in on the sensor. It's not got the highest frame rates possible, which is a bit of a shame. I just wish it could capture a little bit more. Though it does have a full height 6x5 anamorphic mode, which will make the anamorphic crowd very happy. It's also the first Blackmagic camera to use Panasonic's L mount in favor of something like EF, which has been used on plenty of previous Blackmagic cameras. This makes a lot of sense as more and more cameras are using short flange mirrorless mounts as they do have several advantages over a native EF or PL mount. L mount is incredibly adaptable, so you'll easily be able to use L mount native lenses or adapt out to pretty much every other lens mount on the market that isn't shorter than this flange depth. It also has a single CFexpress Type-B card slot, which is great as I think Type-B needs to become the standard in our industry. However, you can also record externally directly to USB-C SSDs, thanks to the camera having a USB-C output. You can of course record B-RAW internally, which is brilliant, and the 6K can now record H.264 proxies simultaneously, which should be really helpful for certain workflows. It shares a lot of the 6K Pro, such as the IO, menu system, monitor and optional viewfinder, but it doesn't have the internal ND system or ability to record ProRes, just B-RAW, both of which I really wish this camera had. We are hopefully getting a camera in to test ourselves soon, so let us know if you have any questions about it down below. Blackmagic also announced two new Atom 1 ME panels, a 20 input version and a 30 input version. They feature the same elegant design as the 2ME and 4ME advanced panels, but in a compact size to fit into any broadcast or studio space. The new 1ME panels include up to three system control LCDs, buttons for control of four upstream keyers, four downstream keyers, and four ME rows, as well as a joystick, T-bar fader, and more. They should be available in October and are available to order now. They also announced the Video Hub 80x80 12G, a larger 80x80 12G SDI router that lets you connect and route any combination of SD, HD, and Ultra HD on the same router at the same time. Blackmagic also showed off an update for the Ursa Broadcasts, which reworks the media page to allow you to shoot proxies 
and then automatically upload them directly to Blackmagic Cloud. This looks like a really nice addition and can even deliver your proxies or original recordings directly to the cloud and into a Cloud Resolve project. This looks like a really powerful workflow, which I hope comes to other Blackmagic cameras, including the new 6K. This will also be possible with their brand new iPhone camera app. I thought this was going to be a control app for their cameras, but it's not. It's actually an interface app for your iPhone for shooting video on that, and it's actually pretty cool. It includes full manual controls, exposure and monitoring tools, and a bunch more. It will also integrate with Blackmagic Cloud, similarly to the ESA Broadcast, so you can more seamlessly use phones in different productions. It's only available on iPhone currently, and it's available to download on the App Store right now. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, and if you want to buy anything you see in this video, or any other filmmaking or photography gear, head over to cvp.com where our experienced team is waiting to help you. Ari have announced their long-awaited Sky Panel update, the Sky Panel X. The original Sky Panel was announced back in 2015, and the lighting market has changed massively since then. Sky Panel X is a modular system which can work in three different configurations, the X21, X22, and X23. This light has been designed to be as flexible as possible, it can easily go from a beautiful soft light to a punchy hard light by simply changing the modifiers on the front. The hard light adapter is called the Hyperoptic, and this features 72 individual lenses and can produce 4800 lux at 10 meters, which is very impressive. It also produces a circular pool of light instead of a rectangle, which is really cool. You can also add diffusion to this if you want to. ARRI will also be making an S60 adapter, which will allow you to adapt existing S60 accessories onto the Sky Panel X. It is a full color fixture that features an array of RGB ACL LEDs with a Kelvin range of 1500 to 20,000. It also produces much better quality light than the old Sky Panel did, thanks to the improved tech inside. Another really cool feature that this light can do is the Alexa modes that it has, which allows you to calibrate the Sky Panel X to the spectral sensitivity of the LF3 and LF4 sensors. This is something that KinoFlow have done before with their True Match firmware update, but it's awesome to see Ari deliver this with the Sky Panel X as well. The fixture also feels incredibly well built and is IP66 rated, which is another massive improvement. The X22 and X23 use two or three of these fixtures in an array using different size yokes. Once placed into the yoke, fixtures can then be daisy chained together via the ethernet and power ports on the rear of the lamps. They can also be controlled in a bunch of different ways, have a built-in ballast, and can be integrated well into virtual production environments. The system really does look incredible and just so well thought out. I'm so excited to get some into the studio and light some stuff ourselves. Two of the biggest products being shown off at the show were Sony's new Cine Auto camera, the Burano, and Cook's new SP3 Primes. Sony were actually showing off this exact combo on their stand, which isn't too surprising given that they pair so well together. We've done in-depth videos of both of these, so if you want to learn more about them, check out those videos via the links below. However, long story short, the Burano is Sony's latest cinema line camera. It features a full-frame 8.6K sensor rated to capture 16 stops of dynamic range, has the ability to record 8.6K up to 30p, 6K up to 60p, and 4K up to 120p in a mix of XOCN RAW and XAVC internally. It has color science similar to the Venice 2, Sony's AI-driven autofocus system, and 5-axis sensor stabilization, all inside a newly designed, robust, but light body. It's a very impressive camera, so if you want to learn more, check out our full review, link to which is in the description below. Sony also announced their new monitor and control app. This is a free app that will work with the a 7 3 FX30, FX3, FX6, and Burano. And this will allow you to monitor and control the cameras via USB or Wi-Fi. This will allow you to fully control the cameras and use a range of exposure tools, including false color, which is awesome to see. However, some features are limited between the different cameras though, such as on the FX6, you'll be able to control both aperture and focus remotely, but not on the FX3 and 30. I'm really excited to get more hands-on time with the app, as we use Red's control app on our Komodo all the time, and I could see us using this when we use Sony cameras as well. It's available to download now on the App Store and the Google Play Store.
Sony also announced a new series of LED panels designed specifically for virtual production applications called Verona. Sony has been developing these for a while and has been working with filmmakers and technicians to really refine the system as much as they could for filmmaking. The big development Sony has made is their deep black and anti-reflection surface technology, which aims to help keep black levels and overall contrast good. In addition to the black levels and low reflection, Verona can also achieve a high brightness of 1500 nits and has a wide color gamut covering more than 97% of DCI-P3. Our new London showroom will be opening this month and we'll have a whole virtual production section there. So let us know if you have any content ideas or what you want to see in the comments below. Cook didn't have a booth at this year's IBC, but they did have their new SP3 lenses all across the different booths for people to check out. It's been really interesting hearing people's thoughts on these as it really is a massive step for a brand as prestigious as Cook to try and break into this new area of the market for them. And I think the reception has been very good overall. The SP3s will allow a whole new level of filmmaker access to the legendary Cook look that people have been lusting over for years. If you want to see exactly how these lenses perform and what we think, check out our full review if you haven't already. Just prior to IBC, Joe managed to head out to Stockholm to check out Fujifilm's latest medium format offering, the GFX 102. Fujifilm have been trying to improve their cameras for video for a while now. And while the GFX is definitely more of a stills focused camera, it has seen some serious improvements in the video department. It features a new 102 megapixel sensor paired with Fuji's latest X processor 5. This results in a readout speed roughly twice as fast as the GFX 100S, with it going as low as 14 milliseconds in certain modes. For a sensor this size, it's quite impressive. The sensor is a massive 439 by 329 millimeters, and how much of it you use in video mode will depend on what mode you are in, but there is a way to use a lot of it, which is awesome. You can record 8K up to 30, 4K up to 60, and a 5.8K 2.35 to 1 mode which uses the full width of the sensor. It even has an anamorphic mode and a range of descreases in camera. It also has very similar video features to the X-H2S, such as the ability to capture an F-Log2 and waveforms and zebras for exposing. Internally, you can record a mix of ProRes, H.264 and H.265 to the new CF Express Type B or SD card slot, or externally to a USB-C SSD. It also has a full-size HDMI port, which can output ProRes RAW or B-RAW up to 8K externally. It also has FrameIO camera to cloud capabilities built in as well. Autofocus has been updated and now has a range of subject detection modes. Sensor stabilization has also been improved as you can now get up to eight stops of stabilization power. It can shoot eight frames per second, which is pretty crazy for a 100 megapixel camera. The body is also a lot smaller than the previous camera and this will make rigging it up for video much easier. The viewfinder is also really nice and can be angled, which can make for some pretty interesting configurations. We should be getting one in soon to check out, so let us know what you want to see us shoot with it down in the comments below. Zcam was showing off a few of their newest cameras at IBC, and this included the E2N, which is essentially an NDI version of their E2C camera, and the E2Z, which is a live stream focused camera with a 35 to 650mm f2 to 3.4 zoom, fast autofocus, and is NDI HX3 capable. They also had their new E2 M5G. This features a very similar body design to the existing E2 cameras, but houses a new 5K micro four thirds global shutter sensor, which Zcam is saying is their best performing sensor in a camera yet. It can record 5K up to 60 and 4K up to 96 frames per second, and has all the features you would expect from a Zcam camera. I'm intrigued to test this and see exactly how it performs, as it could be an interesting solution for a few applications. Zcam also had the Zolar X-Blade 60C on display, which looks pretty unique as it has an IP66 rating, making it an interesting option for people working in wetter climates or even for underwater work, as it has a waterproof cable, which you can get up to 32 meters. Canon announced a few new products just before IBC, and they had them on show with the rest of their existing kit on their stand. The first thing I wanted to check out was their new RF cinema primes, the CNRs. I was really excited when Canon introduced these to us, but was quite disappointed to find out that these are essentially just the CNE primes, but with RF mounts attached to the back of them. This RF mount does make them more robust when mounting them directly onto an RF mount with no support, and it does enable data transfer for metadata and lens correction, but these are the same price as the regular CNEs when picking them up new. 
Having the RF mount permanently attached makes these far less versatile than going with the EF mount versions. So if you do want to get them in RF, make sure you're happy with them only ever being used on RF mount cameras. I understand that Canon has done this to show their commitment to RF mount cinema cameras, with hopefully more coming in the future, but I think they've really missed the mark here. People are crying out for RF mount cinema primes, but these aren't what people want. The CNEs were announced all the way back in 2011. And I think people who want RF mount C primes want to reap the benefits that come with designing lenses for shorter flange cameras that weren't available back then. Cine versions of their RF mount primes would make sense, or even some hybrid lenses like the 18 to 80, so you can use autofocus or slide them into manual focus workflows. People also want more RF mount lenses on the market as a whole, from both Canon and third parties. Hopefully Canon have some plans next year to flesh out this area of their lens lineup as if they do end up bringing out some more RF mount C or video cameras, they will really need to. Anyway, Canon also announced a new PTZ, the CRM100, and a new controller, the RCIP1000. The M100 is now Canon's most affordable PTZ camera to date. It can capture UHD up to 30p and 1080 up to 60p, which can then be fed out over HDMI, IP, or USB. It has a two third inch CMOS sensor, hybrid autofocus, 20 times optical zoom, and can be purchased with auto tracking. It also has support for PoE Plus, a range of control protocols, and NDI HX and SRT support. Ingenue was showing off their newest zoom lens, the EZ3. This new lens is a dual format lens with an excellent range of 45 to 165 mm in its Super 35 mode and 68 to 250 mm in its full frame mode. The T stop will change when using the different rear groups. And the lens does have a little bit of ramping from 135 to 165 millimeters in its Super 35 mode, or 200 to 250 millimeters in full frame. These are some really good zoom ranges, and considering that, it's surprisingly light and compact. The swap between the two rear groups to change formats is also, really no pun intended here, easy. I've done the swap on the original EZ lenses a few times, and seeing Ingenue swap between them at IVC was incredibly impressive as it looks so much faster to do. We also managed to check out the new lens on camera a little bit, and it looks really nice from what we can see, with the big standout being just how little breathing it has. We should be getting one to test soon, which I'm excited for, so let us know if you have any questions about it in the description below. Atlas had their latest addition to their Orion series of two times anamorphic lenses, the 28 mm T2. This now means that they have the 21, 25, 28, and 32 mm which is quite a lot in such a close range of focal lengths. The 28mm is aimed to be a little less extreme when it comes to its distortion than the 21 and the 25mm, while still covering the same Super 35 formats and being T2 like the rest of the set. They also had the second set of three lenses for the Mercuries, which consists of a 54, 95 and 138mm. These look really nice as well, and I can't wait to get them into test like we did with the first set, which are finally starting to ship. DZO Film had their Pavo Anamorphics on show, and I was really excited to check these out. DZO announced these a while back, but due to some user feedback, they delayed the release of them to refine them a bit more. And they look really nice from the time I spent checking them out. They are very compact given that they are two times T2.1 wide open Super 35 covering PL mount anamorphic lenses, and they'll be available with either blue or neutral flares. Personally, I really like the look of the neutral ones. One of the big changes is the distortion, as they've changed it from more pincushion to barrel, which is good as a lot of people, me included, prefer barrel distortion on anamorphic lenses. Considering their price and size, they really do look quite impressive. However, I do really want to test them a bit more. We are planning on creating an anamorphic lens shootout, so let us know if you have any questions about them in the comments. They also had their new 12mm T2.8 Vespid Prime, which we hadn't seen yet. This new lens will be the widest in their Vespid line, coming in just under the 16mm. The Vespid set is incredibly well fleshed out at this point, but it's good that DZO are giving people another option in the ultra wide focal length range. It looks good on camera, though I'm intrigued to see how it flares as the 16mm was a bit wacky. It has a close focus of 20cm, a front diameter of 80mm with no petal hood like the 16mm, and will have the same 46.5mm image circle as the rest of the set. Lawa had a range of new products on display at the show. This included a new light version of their Ranger Zooms. These are made from a material called Magnalium, 
which helps make them roughly 10% lighter than the original Rangers. You can tell them apart by the colour of them, they're a nice space grey. They also had two new focal lengths of their Proteus lenses, a 28mm and 100mm, both of which cover Super 35 and our T2. They also told us about their upcoming Proteus Flex system, which will allow users to change the rear optical block of the Proteus lenses to change the flare colour. This will be great for people who want more versatility out of their Proteus lenses, such as a rental house. They also teased us with a few other new things that they've got planned, but we can't talk about them just yet, but they definitely do have some really cool stuff cooking. Atmos have updated their line of Shogun monitor recorders. These new models feature a 7-inch 2000 nit IPS panel, can record and mix of codecs out of the box, have integrated camera to cloud options, 12G SDI in and out and HDMI in and out, which means cross conversion is possible, and they both run Atom OS 11, which adds a bunch of new features. The Ultra can record 8K Pro as RAW, whereas the regular Shogun is limited to 6K. The Ultra can also record proxies while recording Pro as RAW, and can be triggered via several camera brands. These look like very well featured external recorders that will be very versatile. I just wish that Atmos would also focus on creating more regular monitor options as well as these feature rich recorders. Right Tangerine had a couple of new bits, including their outdated Casper shoulder rig, which looks really, really cool. This redesign is thanks to Bright Tangerine listening to the feedback on their previous version, and this new one looks awesome now because of that. It now has a much wider, larger shoulder pad, which can be massively adjusted. So much so that it means you'll really be able to dial in and control the position of your camera exactly to where it needs to be, no matter how you're built. This is great, and will make getting your rig positioned as comfortably as possible much easier and better. They've also reduced how tall the shoulder pad is and how wide the system is, which will again make it more tailorable for different end users. It honestly looks awesome, and we are really excited for them to start shipping, which should be in Q1 of next year. They also had their new ecosystem of accessories for the Komodo Exxon show. This looks like a pretty robust set of accessories, which is aimed at people wanting to rig the camera up a bit more for use as an A camera. This includes a bunch of different mounting plates and handles, but also power distribution options for different needs. The Komodo X has some pretty essential accessories, and these look to have been thought about when this was designed. It just looks really nice. I like that the side plate is away from the camera, so you can hide cables and maybe even an SDI isolator, which is pretty common to find on Komodo rigs. Let us know how you would rig up the Komodo X with this rigging in the comments below. Axoon had their new Cineview Nano on display, and considering it costs just $129, it looks like a very handy device for anyone wanting to share their image while on set. This new unit is incredibly compact and light at just 72 grams. It has a quoted range of 500 feet or 150 meters, and a latency of around 60 milliseconds, which sounds very good. It uses MPF batteries like the previous version, but also has a USB-C in for powering too. It also has a USB-C out for powering your phone or other accessories. It has a single HDMI input, but can output that image up to four devices, which is awesome. The Axoon app is available for both iOS and Android, and will allow you to use a range of monitoring tools, as well as access streaming directly to a range of different platforms. Considering how cheap and light this thing is, it really can do a lot. And for smaller productions, this could be a great solution to help distribute your image to anyone wanting to view it, while also not breaking the bank. Axoon also announced that the Simu and Simu Pro We'll be getting an update to enable frame IO compatibility. Smori had a few new products on show. First off was their newest light, the RC60B. This is a tiny bicolor LED fixture capable of outputting 30,000 lux at one meter when using the included reflector. It has an internal battery which, according to Smori, will run the fixture for roughly 40 minutes at full brightness. It can also be powered via USB-C, so you can get some decently affordable batteries and just clamp them onto the rear of the fixture. Smorik will also be releasing a few different modifiers for this mini Bowens mount. Up next, they had their new Pro Series of V-mount batteries. This currently consists of just the 99 watt hour version, but they did say that others are coming. This new battery sees a few improvements over the previous ones, such as a full color screen, a new aluminum and metal construction, and more power output options. Lastly, they had this cool teleprompter that mounts via the same mechanism as their matte box and this could be a really helpful solution for anyone wanting an affordable matte box and teleprompter combination, which should actually work pretty well when out on location. Right, let's get into our quickfire honorable mentions. Links to the details about these are in the description below. Nine Solutions showed off a junior and baby pin mounting clamp for 50mm tubes. Adobe have updated Premiere Pro with a bunch of new features. 
Azure announced the Kona X, Aperture has released Sidus Link for ProLite's current fixtures, Atomos released Atom OS 11 for a few of their monitor recorders, and they were showing off Edit Now for Premiere Pro, Cineroid announced the Jupiter 1000 watt rollable RGBWW LED panel, Core SWX released their Nano C98X and Nano U98X batteries, CVW had their new 4K wireless video transmission system, Aurora on display. DAT announced a bunch of new bits. Fujinon had their new 24-300mm Duvo lens on display. FXLion had a new 2400W power station, their Nano wireless battery series, and new bi-voltage V-mount batteries. Godox had a new bi-color 2400W Cobb LED fixture, and their new Lightflow reflector system, which looks very similar to the Lightbridge system. Just before IBC, GoPro announced the Hero 12 Black. Hawkwoods announced a 1600 watt hour floor battery, the Bastion. Into Core had their new screen port SDI Pro. Irix announced a 65mm T1.5 Cine lens, which is great as this set is pretty well fleshed out now. LC Tech was showing off the concept of a 4x5 electronic variable ND filter. Mid49 had their cage for the new Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. Movcam had their Flex Pro on display. Nanlite had their new bicolor FC300B and FC500B fixtures, their new 2004, their new 2400 watt Cobb fixture, and their Pavo Slim panels. Just before IBC, Panasonic announced the G92, their latest Micro Four Thirds camera. Portkeys had their new BM72, a 2200 nit 7 inch monitor. Samyang announced pricing for their Zine Meister lenses, as well as two new focal lengths for them. They also announced an anamorphic attachment and a manual focus attachment for their VAF primes. Sennheiser showed off their new MKH830 mic. Sony announced the ILX LR1 and CBK RPU7, which is a HEBC 4K production unit. Tsuroi had their new autofocus primes, the Snipers, which are f1.2 primes designed for APS-C cameras, and their new SVT75 tripod. Smoke Ninja was showing off the Smoke Genie and Tentacle announced a sync cable for the FX3 and 30. Let us know what your favorite announcement from IBC 2023 was in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you.